Hello, my name is John Nagoski, and I'm a native speaker of English from Wisconsin in the USA. I would like to introduce to you my English reading channel with questions and answers. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill As read by John Nagoski 1936 edition, a public domain book. Think and Grow Rich, Chapter 6, Imagination, the Workshop of the Mind, the Fifth Step Toward Riches. The imagination is literally the workshop wherein are fashioned all plans created by man. The impulse, the desire, is given shape, form, and action through the aid of the imaginative faculty of the mind. It has been said that man can create anything which he can imagine. Of all the ages of civilization, this is the most favorable for the development of the imagination because it is an age of rapid change. On every hand, one may contact stimuli which develop the imagination. Through the aid of his imaginative faculty, man has discovered and harnessed more of nature's forces during the past 50 years than during the entire history of the human race previous to that time. He has conquered the air so completely that the birds are a poor match for him in flying. He has harnessed the ether and made it serve as a means of instantaneous communication with any part of the world. He has analyzed and weighed the sun at a distance of millions of miles and has determined through the aid of imagination, the elements of which it consists. He has discovered that his own brain is both a broadcasting and a receiving station for the privation of thought, and he is beginning now to learn how to make practical use of this discovery. He has increased the speed of locomotion until he may now travel at a speed of more than 300 miles an hour. The time will soon come when a man may breakfast in New York and lunch in San Francisco. Man's only limitation, within reason, lies in his development and use of his imagination. He has not yet reached the apex of development in the use of his imaginative faculty. He has merely discovered that he has an imagination and has commenced to use it in a very elementary way. Two forms of imagination. The imaginative faculty functions in two forms. One is known as synthetic imagination and the other as creative imagination. Synthetic imagination. Through this faculty, one may arrange old concepts, ideas, or plans into new combinations. This faculty creates nothing. It merely works with the material of experience, education, and observation with which it is fed. Creative Imagination Through the faculty of creative imagination, the finite mind of man has direct communication with infinite intelligence. It is the faculty through which hunches and inspirations are received. It is by this faculty that all basic or new ideas are handed over to man. Keep in mind as you follow these principles that the entire story of how one may convert desire into money cannot be told in one statement. The story will be complete only when one has mastered, assimilated, and begun to make use of all the principles. The great leaders of business, industry, finance, and the great artists, musicians, poets, and writers became great because they developed the faculty of creative imagination. Desire is only a thought, an impulse. It is nebulous and ephemeral. It is abstract and of no value until it has been transformed into its physical counterpart. While a synthetic imagination is the one which will be used most frequently, in the process of transforming the impulse of desire into money, you must keep in mind the fact that you may face circumstances and situations which demand use of the creative imagination as well. 
Your imaginative faculty may have become weak through inaction. It can be revived and made alert through use. This faculty does not die, though it may become quiescent through the lack of use. Transformation of the intangible impulse of desire into the tangible reality of money calls for the use of a plan or plans. These plans must be formed with the aid of the imagination. Read the entire book through, then come back to this chapter and begin at once to put your imagination to work on the building of a plan or plans for the transformation of your desire into money. Detailed instructions for the building of plans have been given in almost every chapter. Carry out the instructions best suited to your needs. Reduce your plan to writing. If you have not already done so, the moment you complete this, you will have definitely given concrete form to the intangible desire. Read the preceding sentence once more. Read it aloud, very slowly, and as you do so, Remember that the moment you reduce the statement of your desire and a plan for its realization to writing, you have actually taken the first of a series of steps which will enable you to convert your, the thought into its physical counterpart. The earth on which you live, you yourself, and every other material thing are the result of evolutionary change, through which microscopic bits of matter have been organized and arranged in an orderly fashion. Moreover, and this statement is of stupendous importance, this earth, every one of the billions of individual cells of your body and every atom of matter, began as an intangible form of energy. Desire is thought impulse. Thought impulses are forms of energy. When you begin with the thought impulse, desire, to accumulate money, you are drafting into your service the same stuff that nature used in creating this earth and every material form in the universe, including the body and brain in which the thought impulses function. As far as science has been able to determine, the entire universe consists of a two elements, matter and energy. Through the combination of energy and matter has been created everything perceptible to man, from the largest star which floats in the heavens down to and including man himself. You are now engaged in the task of trying to profit by nature's method. You are, sincerely and earnestly, we hope, trying to adapt yourself to nature's laws by endeavoring to convert desire into its physical or monetary equivalent. You can do it. It has been done before. You can build a fortune through the aid of laws which are immutable. But first, you must become familiar with these laws and learn to use them. Through repetition and by approaching the description of these principles from every conceivable angle, the author hopes to reveal to you the secret through which every great fortune has been accumulated. Strange and paradoxical as it may seem, the secret is not a secret. Nature herself advertises it in the earth on which we live, the stars, the planets, suspended within our view, in the elements above and around us, in every blade of grass and every form of light within our vision. Nature advertises this secret in the terms of biology, in the conversion of a tiny cell, so small that it may be lost on the point of a pin, into the human being now reading this line. The conversion of desire into its physical equivalent is certainly no more miraculous. Do not become discouraged if you do not fully comprehend all that has been stated, unless you have long been a student of the mind. It is not to be expected that you will assimilate all that is in this chapter upon a first reading. But you will, in time, 
make good progress. The principles which follow will open the way for understanding of imagination. Assimilate that which you understand as you read this philosophy for the first time. Then, when you reread and study it, you will discover that something has happened to clarify it and give you a broader understanding of the whole. Above all, do not stop nor hesitate in your study of these principles until you have read the book at least three times, for then you will not want to stop. How to Make Practical Use of Imagination The Enchanted Kettle Ideas are the beginning points of all fortunes. Ideas are products of the imagination. Let us examine a few well-known ideas which have yielded huge fortunes, with the hope that these illustrations will convey definite information concerning the method by which imagination may be used in accumulating riches. Fifty years ago, an old country doctor drove to town, quietly slipped into a drugstore by the back door, and began dickering with the young drug clerk. His mission was destined to yield great wealth to many people. It was destined to bring to the South the most far-flung benefit since the Civil War. For more than an hour, behind the prescription counter, the old doctor and the clerk talked in low tones. Then the doctor left. He went out to the buggy and brought back a large, old-fashioned kettle, a big wooden paddle, used for stirring the contents of the kettle, and deposited them in the back of the store. The clerk inspected the kettle, reached into his inside pocket, took out a roll of bills and handed over to the doctor. The roll contained exactly five hundred dollars. The clerk's entire savings. The doctor handed over a small slip of paper on which was written a secret formula. The words on that small slip of paper were worth a king's ransom, but not to the doctor. Those magic words were needed to start the kettle to boiling, but neither the doctor nor the young clerk knew what fabulous fortunes were destined to flow from that kettle. The old doctor was glad to sell the outfit for $500. The money would pay off his debts and give him freedom of mind. The clerk was taking a big chance by staking his entire life savings on a mere scrap of paper and an old kettle. He never dreamed his investment would start a kettle to overflowing with gold that would surpass the miraculous performance of Aladdin's lamp. What the clerk really purchased was an idea. The old kettle and the wooden paddle and the secret message on a slip of paper were incidental. The strange performance of that kettle began to take place after the new owner mixed with the secret instructions an ingredient of which the doctor knew nothing. Read the story carefully. Give your imagination a test. See if you can discover what it was that the young man added to the secret message which caused the kettle to overflow with gold. Remember, as you read, that this is not a story from Arabian Nights. Here you have a story of facts, stranger than fiction, facts which began in the form of an idea. Let us take a look at the vast fortunes of gold this idea has produced. It has paid and still pays huge fortunes to men and women all over the world who distribute the contents of the kettle to millions of people. The old kettle is now one of the world's largest consumers of sugar, thus providing jobs of permanent nature to thousands of men and women engaged in growing sugar cane and in refining and marketing sugar. The old kettle consumes, annually, millions of glass bottles, providing jobs to huge numbers of glass workers. The old kettle gives employment to an army of clerks, stenographers, copywriters, and advertising experts throughout the nation. It has brought fame and fortune to scores of artists, who have created magnificent pictures describing the product. The old kettle has converted a small southern city into the business capital of the South, 
where it now benefits, directly or indirectly, every business and practically every resident of the city. The influence of this idea now benefits every civilized country in the world, pouring out a continuous stream of gold to all who touch it. Gold from the kettle built and maintains one of the most prominent colleges of the South, where thousands of young people receive the training essential for success. The old kettle has done other marvelous things. All through the world depression, when factories, banks, and business houses were folding up and quitting by the thousands, the owner of this enchanted kettle went marching on, giving continuous employment to an army of men and women all over the world, and paying out extra portions of gold to those who long ago had faith in the idea. If the product of that old brass kettle could talk, it would tell thrilling tales of romance in every language. Romances of love, romances of business, romances of professional men and women who are daily being stimulated by it. The author is sure of at least one such romance, for he was part of it, and it all began not far from the very spot on which the drug clerk purchased the old kettle. It was here that the author met his wife, and it was she who first told him of the enchanted kettle. It was the product of that kettle they were drinking when he asked her to accept him, for better or worse. Now that you know the content of the enchanted kettle is a world-famous drink, it is fitting that the author confess that the home drink of the drink supplied him with a wife, also that the drink itself provides him with stimulation of thought without intoxication, and thereby it serves to give the refreshment of mind which an author must have to do his best work. Whoever you are, wherever you may live, whatever occupation you may be engaged in, just remember in the future, every time you see the words Coca-Cola, that his vast empire of wealth and influence grew out of a single idea, and that the mysterious ingredient, the drug clerk, Asa Candler, mixed with the secret formula was imagination. Stop and think of that for a moment. Remember also that the 13 steps to riches described in this book were the media through which the influence of Coca-Cola has been extended to every city, town, village, and crossroads of the world, and that any idea you may create as bold and meritorious as Coca-Cola has the possibility of duplicating the stupendous record of this worldwide thirst killer. Truly, thoughts are things, and their scope of operation is the world itself. What would I do if I had a million dollars? This story proves the truth of that old saying, where there's a will, there's a way. It was told to me by that beloved educator and clergyman, the late Frank W. Gonzalez, who began his preaching career in the stockyards region of South Chicago. While Dr. Gonzalez was going through college, he observed many defects in our educational system, defects which he believed he could correct. If he were the head of a college, his deepest desire was to become the directing head of an educational institution in which young men and women would be taught to learn by doing. He made up his mind to organize a new college in which he could carry out his ideas without being handicapped by orthodox methods of education. He needed a million dollars to put the project across. Where was he to lay his hands on so large a sum of money? That was the question that absorbed most of this ambitious young preacher's thought. But he couldn't seem to make any progress. Every night he, he took that thought to bed with him. He got up with it in the morning. He took it with him everywhere he went. He turned it over and over in his mind 
until it became a consuming obsession with him. A million dollars is a lot of money. He recognized that fact, but he also recognized the truth that the only limitation is that which one sets up in one's own mind. Being a philosopher as well as a preacher, Dr. Gonzalez recognized, as do all who succeed in life, that definiteness of purpose is the starting point from which one must begin. He recognized, too, that definiteness of purpose takes on animation, life, and power, when backed by a burning desire to translate that purpose into its material equivalent. He knew all these great truths, yet he did not know where or how to lay his hands on a million dollars. The natural procedure would have been to give up and quit by saying, Ah, well, my idea is a good one, but I cannot do anything with it, because I never can procure the necessary million dollars. That is exactly what the majority of people would have said, but it is not what Dr. Gonzalez said. What he said and what he did are so important that I now introduce him and let him speak for himself. One Saturday afternoon, I sat in my room thinking of ways and means of raising the money to carry out my plans. For nearly two years I had been thinking, but I had done nothing but think. The time had come for action. I made up my mind then and there, that I would get the necessary million dollars within a week. How? I was not concerned about that. The main thing of importance was the decision to get the money within a specified time, and I want to tell you that the moment I reached a definite decision to get the money within a specified time, a strange feeling of assurance came over me, such as I had never before experienced. Something inside me seemed to say, Why didn't you reach that decision a long time ago? The money was waiting for you all the time. Things began to happen in a hurry. I called the newspapers and announced I would preach a sermon the following morning entitled, What Would I Do If I Had a Million Dollars? I went to work on the sermon immediately, but I must tell you frankly, the task was not difficult, because I had been preparing that sermon for almost two years. The spirit back of it was a part of me. Long before midnight, I had finished writing the sermon. I went to bed and slept with a feeling of confidence, for I could see myself already in possession of the million dollars. Next morning, I arose early, went into the bathroom, read the sermon, then knelt on my knees and asked that my sermon might come to the attention of someone who would supply the needed money. While I was praying, I again had that feeling of assurance that the money would be forthcoming. In my excitement, I walked out without my sermon and did not discover the oversight until I was in my pulpit and about ready to begin delivering it. It was too late to go back for my notes, and what a blessing that I couldn't go back. Instead, my own subconscious mind yielded the material I needed. When I rose to begin my sermon, I closed my eyes and spoke with all my heart and soul of my dreams. I not only talked to my audience, but I fancy I also talked to God. I told what I would do with a million dollars if that amount were placed in my hands. I described the plan I had in mind for organizing a great educational institution where young people would learn to do practical things and at the same time develop their minds. When I had finished and sat down, a man slowly arose from his seat, about three rows from the rear, and made his way toward the pulpit. I wondered what he was going to do. He came into the pulpit, extended his hand, and said, Reverend, I liked your sermon. I believe you can do everything you said you would if you had a million dollars. To prove that I believe in you and your sermon, if you will come to my office tomorrow morning, I will give you the million dollars. My name is Philip D. Armour. 
Young Gonzalez went to Mr. Armour's office, and the million dollars was presented to him. With the money, he founded the Armour Institute of Technology. That is more money than the majority of preachers ever see in an entire lifetime. Yet the thought impulse back of the money was created the young preacher's mind in a fraction of a minute. The necessary million dollars came as a result of an idea. Back of the idea was a desire which young Gonzalez had been nursing in his mind for almost two years. Observe this important fact. He got the money within 36 hours after he reached a definite decision in his own mind to get it and decided upon a definite plan for getting it. There was nothing new or unique about young Gonzalez's vague thinking about a million dollars and weakly hoping for it. Others before him, and many since his time, have had similar thoughts. But there was something very unique and different about the decision he reached on that memorable Saturday when he put vagueness into the background and definitely said, I will get that money within a week. God seems to throw himself on the side of the man who knows exactly what he wants, if he is determined to get just that. Moreover, the principle through which Dr. Gonzalez got his million dollars is still alive. It is available to you. This universal law is as workable today as it was when the young preacher made use of it so successfully. This book describes, step by step, the thirteen elements of this great law and suggests how they may be put to use. Observe that Asa Candler and Dr. Frank Gonzalez had one characteristic in common. Both knew the astounding truth that ideas can be transmuted into cash through the power of definite purpose plus definite plans. If you are one of those who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, perish the thought. It is not true. Riches, when they come in huge quantities, are never the result of hard work. Riches come, if they come at all, in response to definite demands, based upon the application of definite principles and not by chance or luck. Generally speaking, an idea is an impulse of thought that impels action by an appeal to the imagination. All master salesmen know that ideas can be sold where merchandise cannot. Ordinary salesmen do not know this. That is why they are ordinary. A publisher of books, which sell for a nickel, made a discovery that should be worth much to publishers generally. He learned that many people buy titles and not contents of books. By merely changing the name of one book that was not moving, his sales on that book jumped upward more than a million copies. The inside of the book was not changed in any way. He merely ripped off the cover bearing the title that did not sell and put on a new cover with a title that had box office value. That, as simple as it may seem, was an idea. It was imagination. There is no standard price on ideas. The creator of ideas makes his own price, and if he is smart, gets it. The moving picture industry created a whole flock of millionaires. Most of them were men who couldn't create ideas, but they had the imagination to recognize ideas when they saw them. The next flock of millionaires will grow out of the radio business, which is new and not overburdened with men of keen imagination. The money will be made by those who discover or create new and more meritorious radio programs and have the imagination to recognize merit and to give their radio listeners a chance to profit by it. If this new field of opportunity intrigues you, perhaps you might profit by the suggestion that the successful radio programs of the future will give more attention to creating buyer audiences and less attention to listener audiences. Stated more plainly, the builder of radio programs who succeeds in the future 
must find practical ways to convert listeners into buyers. Moreover, the successful producer of radio programs in the future must key his features so that he can definitely show its effect upon the audience. Another thing that might as well be understood by those who contemplate entering this new field of opportunity, radio advertising is going to be handled by an entirely new group of advertising experts, separate and distinct from the old-time newspapers and magazine advertising agency men. The new radio technique demands men who can interpret ideas from a written manuscript in terms of sound. It costs the author a year of hard labor and many thousands of dollars to learn this. Radio right now is about where the moving pictures were when Mary Pickford and her curls first appeared on the screen. Never let it discourage you if you have no experience in radio. Andrew Carnegie knew very little about making steel. I have Carnegie's own word for this, but he made practical use of two of the principles described in this book and made the steel business yield him a fortune. The story of practically every great fortune starts with the day when a creator of ideas and a seller of ideas got together and worked in harmony. Carnegie surrounded himself with men who could do all that he could not do, men who created ideas and men who put ideas into operation, and made himself and the others fabulously rich. When the idea was first planted in my mind by Mr. Carnegie, it was coaxed, nursed, and enticed to remain alive. Gradually, the idea became a giant under its own power, and it coaxed, nursed, and drove me. Ideas are like that. First you give life and action and guidance to ideas, then they take on power of their own and sweep aside all opposition. Ideas are intangible forces, but they have more power than the physical brains that give birth to them. They have the power to live on after the brain that creates them has returned to dust. For example, take the power of Christianity. That began with a simple idea, born in the brain of Christ. Its chief tenet was, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Christ has gone back to the source from whence he came, but his idea goes marching on. Someday it may grow and come into its own. Then it will have fulfilled Christ's deepest desire. The idea has been developing only 2,000 years. Give it time. Success requires no explanations. Failure permits no alibis. This is the end of chapter 6. Thank you.